we have our the second half of our program and it's my pleasure to kick this off tonight by introducing our keynote speaker and fellow Cures Within Reach business advisor, uh, Dr. Don Frail of AstraZeneca. Dr. Frail leads the science group in New Opportunities IMED, which seeks collaborations that complement AstraZeneca's core areas through drug positioning and open innovation partnerships. Recently, his team implemented groundbreaking partnerships with the NIH and the Medical Research Council in the UK to collaborate with investigators to, to explore the use of AstraZeneca development compounds in new indications. Prior to joining AstraZeneca, Don held several leadership positions, including founder and chief scientific officer of the Indications Discovery Unit at Pfizer, head of Pfizer's St. Louis Research and Development Site, vice president of biology for the St. Louis Site, and head of discovery neurosciences at Pharmacia. Dr. Frail co-authored the book Re Drug Repositioning, Bringing New Life to Shelved Assets and Existing Drugs, and uh, he brings his drug repositioning expertise to us tonight. Uh, please join me in giving a warm Chicago welcome to Don as he addresses rediscovery research and repositioning for patient benefit. Don Frail. Thank you, Jeff, and thank my thanks to Bruce and all those involved for this invitation and opportunity. Uh, what I plan to do is share with you a bit about what I do uh, with the hope that, they'll, that you'll then better understand what uh, Cures Within Reach does. Um, I am going to talk about repositioning research, and I do have slides. I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I have to have slides. Um, and I'm going to talk about an alternative way to do drug discovery that uh, is done by Cures Within Research. And actually, I do a bit of it myself as well. And I realize we have kind of a mixed audience in terms of experience. Some of you know drug discovery incredibly well. For those, I apologize a little bit. For others, uh, maybe not so much. And I'll catch you up to speed. Uh, so this slide is a depiction of the research and development paradigm, the standard paradigm. And uh, those colors on the left, the first four boxes up to the green, is really the research portion of it. And the second to the last box on the right is the uh, development part of it. And what we mean by development is the testing in humans. And testing in humans is usually done in three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. And actually, just by being depicted with one box underserves uh, how complex and how important this is. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, there are three truths in, uh, in drug development of medicines. And the first is that most drugs fail during the drug testing process. And this is um, a fact of life that we live as, as researchers. And it's actually quite unusual to have a success. And if you look at this little graph, I have to show a piece of data. Um, this is the success of a drug in what we call phase two clinical testing. And phase two is where you're going to test the first signs of uh, whether your drug can be effective in that patient population. And what's so amazing about this slide is the y-axis that that curve there peaks at around 30% success rate and uh, trending now towards about 20% success rate. So if you're a major league ball player, you'd be fired. Um, if you could boost this in the drug discovery world up to about 30%, you'd be doing great. The other thing is that it takes a long time and a lot of money to develop some drugs. Uh, if you look back at that R&D paradigm, those first four boxes or so, it's listed around uh, five or six years, and that that development box I talked about is, again, another six years or so. And that sometimes is an underestimate. And finally, what is really interesting is that those drugs that actually do get to market, so they are effective in patients, are more often than not indicated for more than one indication, more than one treatment paradigm. And by far, the majority of drugs on the market have uh, approval labels for more than one indication. So this is a standard drug discovery R&D paradigm. Uh, there is alternatives as well, and a corollary to the standard paradigm. And 
uh, called a number of different names and aliases, rediscovery, repurposing, repositioning, indication discovery, rescue, drug rescue. And basically, they all typically refer to taking a drug that you have and looking for new uses in different diseases. From that was initially studied. Of course, that's why we're here today. And uh, this kind of paradigm, why, do, why would you want to do this? Um, I think uh, Bruce articulated very well. You have this drug in hand. Uh, you want to, you can skip the earlier steps of trying to create that drug, and you go right into some, some testing paradigm. Uh, so you avoid uh, a lot of the risk associated with the failure of that drug. Uh, you reduce their cost getting there, and you actually increase their probability of success overall in the timelines. I just want to point out one example, uh, and the classic example, this is Viagra. Uh, so Viagra was first tested for angina in a patient population, and uh, it didn't quite meet its spec for angina, but what was discovered in those clinical trials is that some of the males were having erections. And interestingly enough, the science behind it was catching up at that point, too. So it actually made sense. And lo and behold, you have Vi Viagra. But what you probably, most of you don't know, is that Viagra then was also repurposed again for a treatment against pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is an incredibly severe disease. And so, uh, again, t twice now, it's made a huge impact uh, on p different patients' lives and is instructive as a key example. So, um, this is a slide, actually, of what I do, and I show you this because on the next slide, I'm going to show you what Cures does, and I'm going to compare and contrast them. And uh, so what I do at AstraZeneca is repurposing f with a focus on AstraZeneca compounds. And if you look at that red box, that's the focus where our active compounds that are in clinical development or our discontinued failed compounds, my group will ask what else are they good for. And we do engage external partners in large ways. We've set up collaborations with the NIH, with the Medical Research Council in the UK, and some others, to try to come up with new hypotheses that we should be testing. But a key point here is there's a lot of projects that we elect not to prosecute. And we elect not to prosecute them for multiple reasons. They are listed here. In fact, it might be a great idea, but we actually don't have a compound for it. We don't have a suitable compound because of a tox issue or, or some other feature. <coughs> a key one is well, we may not have uh, what we call exclusivity period, whether it's a patent exclusivity or regulatory exclusivity. I'm going to come back to this one. Uh, it could be that the market's too small. Uh, it could be that there's a high risk with no regulatory approved endpoints. It may not fit with our business strategy. And we actually do have limited capital to invest and have to make choices and prioritize. And so um, these are key reasons why we may not uh, focus on a particular project that has high merit. And coming back to this bit about exclusivity or the patient uh, uh, population may not be large enough, this is really important because I'm going to give you an example of a drug that is off patent. So if you think about Lipitor, Lipitor is a classic drug for hypercholesterolemia, and it just went off patent about a year ago. And I would kind of predict that there'll never be another FDA-approved indication for Lipitor, even if it were um, a, a cure for uh, some severe disease like Alzheimer's. And the reason is simply that the cost to get to the FDA approval and do those clinical studies in humans to actually get approval, the company that invests in that will never recoup the cost because the drug is now generic. And there's really not a way to overcome that. And so there is, uh, this is a unique feature I think of cures about trying to address one of these problems and, and such a unique fit uh, and niche that they provide as well. So this is what Cures does. It's very similar. And I met Bruce in December and first heard about the model and was very attracted to it and immediately struck me uh, how attractive it is. 
And so the focus there is uh, approved drugs. They could be branded, I guess. They could be generics, other things. And so if you think about the scope of uh, possibilities, it's actually much larger than what I have at my disposal. And uh, you've already seen the engagement of some key external partners uh, to generate new hypotheses. And what's interesting, though, is that a lot of the reasons why we may not continue a project uh, are eliminated by this model. And so if you think about it, we may not have the compound. We have a limited data set. There's far more approved drugs. There's much likelihood that there'll be a compound out there. This whole business about data exclusivity and the patient size kind of goes away in the sense that even a publication of the result of the use of that drug that allows doctors then to subscribe that drug to a patient population and test it out. And um, so market size being too small doesn't matter. Um, the fact that uh, there's no business strategy per se, uh, there may be patient advocacy strategies, there may be uh, particular focus, areas of focus, but uh, there's not that constraint. The one constraint we do share actually is limited capital to invest. And so uh, that's a um, problem we both seek to so solve. So when I learned about cures, the first thing that struck me was about its efficiency. And I, I bring this up because we've already heard the story today where the first uh, study was seeded with $25,000. We've seen others, if you saw the slides during dinner, other grants around 100000 or so. And I can tell you that in the research world, these are small sums of money to be able to have such a huge impact. And um, so the efficiency of this model is huge. We've already seen, too, about the engagement of top institutions and academics for generating the ideas and supporting those uh, and the successes that they've had. And finally, we've seen a multiple uh, diseases that they've been able to approach as well and how they've engaged patient advocacy groups in these. So the organization has had huge success to date. And despite this success, uh, they still face the one shared problem that, that, uh, that one barrier we saw before, and that's limited dollars to invest in projects. And that's where you've all come in, and the organization thanks you very much for your support today. And I hope I've been able to tell you a little bit about and give you a little bit better understanding about the important niche and the role that the organization plays in being able to bring cures to patients. It does fill a huge need that the pharmaceutical companies, the profit for profits, is not going to fill. And it is um, really for patients something that's got to be solved, and I think they have a model to solve it. And so with that, thank you for this continued support, uh, and hope that we can continue the fine work uh, going into the future. Thank you.